articulate what I'm saying through what I do at that moment. So that way I can always try to be who I want to be. And uh, like you guys were just saying, um, if you've met one person with Asperger's, you've met one person with Asperger's. Because mm -hmm. uh, the development is so unique with each case for the environment they live in. Mm. Yeah. So I think we're going to hear a different story talking to Reese from yeah. what we heard with Tiana. I didn't have the fortune uh, of uh, knowing about Arabina or that when I was a kid. I went through a lot of uh, primary schools, I think it was five all up. Um, I did find friends and I did uh, fit in in my own little weird way, but uh, um, something always came along that was knocking us back. Education system gave me a routine, which was good, but um, I don't know what exactly was missing, but it just wasn't working for me. I wasn't learning anything from school. I was learning more from uh, documentaries that my brother used to love watching or uh, things my family would tell me and teach me. Um, and it wasn't until later on when I actually started to um, learn for myself and actually go and seek my own learning. Mm. So you had um, a number of different schools that you went to over yep. the time and of course you're a lot older than Tiana. I think it sounds like Tiana has only had one school so far, as well as ever been at, but you had three different primary schools. Yeah, the stability for me wasn't working. I just couldn't <coughs> seem to keep going and fitting into what people kept trying to make me fit into. A lot of teachers were like, why isn't this kid learning this? And I do remember the few teachers that just accepted me for who I was, and I respe respected them greatly for it. And uh, I think if I learned anything from those schools, it would have been from those teachers. Mm. I remember you said to me before that you could really remember the few good teachers you had, the few yeah. good teachers really stood out. Yeah. So what do you think was different about about the teachers that you clicked with or, were, or sort of could, that you could connect with and the other teachers? Um, I have to say that I think these teachers respected their kids. They, they thought, they didn't judge them in any way, they just thought, okay, this kid's like this. And that was all I needed. They just were like, yep, you're like that. If you do things like that, that's the way he does it. And you go, alright, this is the way we do it. Not, this is the way you have to do it, or this is the way you should do it. It was just, oh, this is the way you do it, and this is how we do it. And, and if I want to do it that way, then I can. <laughs> and uh, I love those teachers. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, grade one. Um, we were, had cut out cut um, cut out pages with uh, writing on it. I can't remember what it said, but. and um, then we had a coloured piece of paper that we were um, glue sticking these sheets onto. And I remember put in them on an angle. <laughs> and uh, so the corner would meet each corner, each, each wall, and I liked it. I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> it was the beginnings of your artistic... And I remember my teacher saying, no, do it again. Take it off, put it straight the way it should be. And it's like, oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I remember uh, my art teachers and then just going, wow, how can you draw like that? Because I would just start drawing an object from one side and just continue. I wouldn't, like put a circle and then go, okay, so clock hand, yeah. I did not um, build the foundations of it. I just started drawing from one side and finished the other side. It was like a printer. Interesting. All my art teachers thought it was quite nice and they used to really encourage me to just keep going. But I um, didn't really start into art until later. Mm, mm, okay. So I think you were telling me before that things were a bit different with your academic subjects and learning, reading and writing and spelling was, wasn't, didn't come that easy to you? Um, yeah, uh, English language isn't um, phonetic and that's how my mind works. If I was born in Italy and I grew up speaking Italian, I'd be very good at language. <laughs> um, but I just can't seem to find the hold on the uniqueness of uh, English words. Um, conceptually, I associate them with pictures that mean something to me, and that's how I speak. Um, I spent so much time learning to articulate myself so that uh, I could be understood about the pe by the people that I love, that um, this is why I have these skills. 
and the ability to actually talk with English um, to a, a good extent. Yeah. So, ha have you heard about um, the famous woman with autism called Temple Grandin who talks about thinking in pictures? Mm -hmm. is, would you I've describe yourself as thinking in pictures? Um, it's, or is it not, not like that? Uh, it's a bit difficult to explain. I guess uh, I'd say that a lot of things that happen in my head is a picture. I'll see something visually and I'll get it like that. If I hear something, it'll take me longer. I don't know if I'm processing it with pictures, but I know that I respond to visual stimuli a lot more. It also means I can't cut down on the information I'm getting visually. Mm. Like, uh, mm. fluorescent lights, they sting my eyes, and if I have to spend six hours in a room with them, I'll be going nuts. Mm. Mm. So that's, that's maybe an example of one of the sensory issues that people on the autism spectrum have, that they're very sensitive to different sorts of sensory input, mm. and fluorescent lights mm. might be one yeah, of them. Yeah, um, I've come across um, some yeah, information recently that's been quite interesting, which was uh, neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. which is when the brain is overstimulated and um, I think this is because of my inability to filter the information and because I'm getting all this extra stimuli and I can't shut it off that's why I get so easily distracted and hard to follow conversations and I think this would stop development a lot. I don't know if this research is solid yet but um, I think it's quite interesting and I thought you guys might want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well there's certainly a lot of, um, a lot of the research <laughs> in relation to autism spectrum disorder suggests that mm -hmm. people can be really feel overwhelmed by the amount of sensory input. Easily, easily mm -hmm. overwhelmed. Uh, I remember having to live next to a job site for six months and I uh, degraded my um, life quality quite a lot. When you were what, living next to a job site? Uh, we, what do you mean by that? Uh, my dad um, subdivided a property we were living uh -huh. on and because of a financial problem with a partner we just had to um, live on the job site. So we were living on the house at the front and then they were building <coughs> four units. So there's lots of noise and banging going on. Yeah, being people. woken up at like seven in the morning by a drop saw is never fun. <laughs> and no one likes this. Let alone no, someone sure who's no over like by it. <laughs> but yes, maybe it was even harder for you than for neurotypicals. Yeah, um, I tried to get out as much as I could when that was happening. Or at least just get into my own little space. Mm. Mm. Yes, well, I wonder if you can think about some of the, any other um, sensory issues that you might have had over the years. Any, um, any, anything particular? Um, well... Anyone want to throw something at me? <laughs> <laughs> so, food. Food? food? Yes, uh, food's quite interesting. Um, some things uh, I just can't enjoy. Um, and uh, some things I, I can't get enough of. Um, I love salt. Salt's something that's very stimulating, but that's for everyone, I think. <laughs> um, but I do enjoy it. Um, I love spicy foods. Because um, it's so much information I'm getting from it, I get so lost in the moment that it's just like, oh, nice. <laughs> it's quite fun. And uh, Nando's is one good one. <laughs> Can I, can I say a quick one with that? Yeah, this is my brother, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a little example for food. We used to do family meals like uh, once a month and one person would pick where we go. He used to love McDonald's and we thought it's because he loved McDonald's food. One day he tells us it's not because he likes the food, it always tastes the same. <laughs> So he liked going there because he knew what he was going to get. Yeah. But he, yeah. You didn't even like the taste. You said yeah, you don't yeah. like the taste. It was just, it was never uh, a change. It was just something I was comfortable with. And funnily enough, my mum's spaghetti bolognese was always just perfect. <laughs> I don't know if she did that for me, but I always loved it when she was making it. Good old mum. Um, anything else on food? Maybe a classroom. Classroom? Yeah, how, how can a classroom um, be overstimulating? Um, lots of reasons. Um, I'd say the majority would have been the social interaction and trying to keep up with cues from people. Uh, it's difficult to follow a conversation when you can only focus on one thing at a time, uh, especially when it's jumping between more than two people. I've 
gotten better at it and I just process things quick enough to keep up with one person <coughs> and kind of build a picture of what they're talking about. So pretty good at predicting things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess that's how I'd do it. But actually I went back to high school after I left to learn social skills. I intentionally put myself into a classroom which I knew would stress me out and overstimulate me so I could learn to cope and learn how to socialise with people and have friends. Uh, but